Okay, everybody, thank you all for coming. We'll probably have a few more people join, but we have a lot of people on the line. I really appreciate everybody coming. I'm so glad. Again, I know a few of our wine uh, deliveries were a little late. If you didn't get yours, just hang on. We'll, uh, I'm happy you logged in with us and you'll still get all of the great knowledge of when you receive your wine. You'll be able to, um, to get caught up on all of these great tasting notes we're going to get today. So um, I kind of want to just go around and mention a couple of um, things we're going to do today, but I want to start um, with Matt Wren. So Matt is joining us from the Colts tailgate. So, and Matt's going to talk to us uh, just for a minute about Mosier and about, um, you know, uh, why we wanted to bring this to everybody today and a little bit about us. Yeah, thanks, Melinda. So uh, my name is Matt Wren. I am the Managing Director of Business Development. So handle all of sales for here at Mosier on the commercial and the university side of things. Um, uh, Mosier has five total divisions now. We have application services um, from .NET, UI, UX, Human Centered Design, Java, Open Source across the board, business services, PMs, BAs, tech writers, um, GDPR, or CCA, PAs. I love do some Alaskan things and also uh, business process mapping. And also we have data analytics, which is why we're here to talk about our honeycomb product today. So a lot of you, I did get a meet out in uh, Las Vegas. So we were a pleasure to be at the National Sherm Conference and uh, I'll let the, the experts talk a little bit more about that. And then finally, infrastructure services, uh, where we do tier one, tier two, and then your system and cloud support across the board. So Mosher has been in business for 25 years. Ty and Paula Mosher did start that for us. And Ty was actually full billable pretty much up to six years ago. And we're located uh, here in Indianapolis, Indiana, and like I said, we're lucky enough to be down here tailgating. So if you're going to be at the Colts game, please stop by and uh, get a burger. Or a bro we got Brock's already cooking for us right here. We got Bob Cantman, our Vice President of Business Services, and some other people. So I will uh, pass it back over to you, Melinda, and thank you, uh, everybody, for joining. Enjoy the wonderful wine. And actually, I just think my wine got delivered at my house, so we will enjoy that tomorrow. Oh. So. Um, we're going to kick it to Adrian, but before we do, while Adrian's getting her set up, I just wanted to say hi to our um, our guests from the vineyard who are going to be sharing with us in a few minutes. Um, if you just want to introduce yourself real fast and just say your names, and then we'll kick it to Adrian, and then you'll get started on the first one. Sounds good, guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, we are excited to do this uh, virtual tasting event with you guys. And uh, I'm Chris uh, Richard. I am the sales and hospitality director here at Brickler Vineyards. And next to me, I have... I'm Joanna. I am the Hospitality and Education Manager here at Bricolair Vineyards. We were supposed to have Mark Hansen, which was the, the, one of the owners of the winery, but unfortunately Mark double booked himself and had a charity event he had to go to in New Orleans for the Emerald Lagasse Foundation. So instead I have Joanna, which is even better. You guys will love her more, so don't worry. But we're excited to be here with you guys. Awesome. Thank you. So um, just for a couple of minutes, we're going to kick it over to Adrienne. I'll let her introduce herself and talk just for a minute about, um, about Honeycomb and about the solution. Some of you saw the solution in, um, at the SHRM conference in Las Vegas and how, how it can transform your data. And um, Adrienne, if you want to unmute and do a share, she's going to give us a few minutes of Honeycomb. Hi, can you hear me? All right. Um, hi, I'm Adrian. I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes about what Honeycomb is and then share a dashboard with you and talk through the data story that it tells. So first off, you know, what is Honeycomb? It's a comprehensive data and analytics solution hosted by Mosher Consulting and powered by Red Hat. It's designed to centralize your data into a usable platform. What does that mean? I'm going to highlight four components today which drive Honeycomb. The first is data. Uh, Honeycomb includes a data repository to bring all of your data sources together from all the systems in your organization in an accessible place and format to give meaning, to be able to drive insights and make data-driven decisions. Next is analytics. The data may pre be presented via reports and or dashboards designed with an emphasis on strong visuals and telling stories with data. And we're also gonna highlight some value add around business process improvement and how our approach is focused on collaboration and becoming a trusted partner. And finally, the bottom honeycomb on the screen 
just highlights the fact that we don't replace your HR system. We add on to it, we enhance it through data engineering and analytics. Next, I'm gonna talk about data. Although we are focused on how we can benefit HR teams today, Honeycomb drives insights across a variety of industries and departments. We've highlighted some of these on this report to share with you today. In addition to HR recruiting and payroll, we also are working with operations, support in IT, supply chain and engineering, and sales and business development teams amongst other departments. This top box highlights different industries. This list spans everything from global manufacturers to government to healthcare and ABA therapy providers to nonprofits and faith-based organizations. And the last box on this screen contain some examples of data sources. It includes various HR and recruiting systems, social media, such as Google Analytics, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram, finance, and not only your internal systems, but you can also connect to your bank and credit cards like MasterCard. Ticketing systems, such as ServiceNow, Jira, Azure DevOps, healthcare EMRs, EHRs, and also documents, images, video, and audio can be ingested in a honeycomb. And finally, down at the bottom, I just wanted to highlight that if your organization is interested in external data sources, we could integrate with the USPS to validate your zip code and addresses to verify that your data entry doesn't have any typos or mistakes in it. You could also ingest data from salary.com or payscale.com to see how your organization's salaries compares to the, the data available in these public data sets. In summary, Honeycomb can bring in any data source that is open. And then I want to highlight the last three components of Honeycomb. The analytics component is where we're going to, that's what we're going to demo later today. That includes reporting, visualizations, dashboards, and telling stories with data. Using these artifacts to drive insights, take action and make decisions. These can be available online, on mobile devices, delivered to your inbox, or embedded into other applications. The analytics component also includes advanced analytics, such as data science, machine learning, or predictive analytics. Business process improvement. As the Honeycomb teams partner with key stakeholders and end users in your organization, they will share any opportunities for process improvement. If there's anything that could be streamlined or automated um, or a way to reduce repeated data entry, they'll make it easy to find the data that you need instead of having to log into several different systems to do research and get counts. You can identify trends. No need to look back through email messages to find the Excel sheet from last quarter and see how it compares to this quarter. Year over year, quarter over quarter, or month over month can be visible on the screen anytime. And finally, I want to highlight our approach. Our teams are agile and trained listeners. They truly listen to the requests from your team. What challenges that your team could be having? What are they trying to solve? And how can we best represent that visually so that the viewers of the report can interpret the story at a glance, gain insights to the data, and be able to make decisions? We will meet with end users and key stakeholders to drive the use cases. Our goal is that you have an end product that you're happy with. The team, the Honeycomb teams won't gather requirements and then go off for weeks and then show up with a final product that you're surprised about. We walk the journey together with demonstrations along the way, showing you report iterations on the screen, collecting feedback and iterating or adjusting as needed. You drive the process, not us. Our goal is to become a trusted advisor and a partner throughout the process. And now for a quick demo of one of our dashboards. Uh, this demo is focused on rec the recruitment process. And so you could have a homepage or a landing page designed like this, and it is clickable, and it will navigate you to more in detail reports. Today, I was gonna highlight an applicant journey report. So this organization identified several milestones throughout the hiring process. 
And so for them, they have documented when the applications are received. Their next step is screening, like a phone screen or an, H an HR recruiting screen. If the candidate passes that, they'll progress to a round one and a round two interview or a third round technical interview. After that, um, references are verified or any other follow-up or um, documentation that's needed. And then a background check to where an offer is extended, the candidate is uh, accepts or is approved to the date that they start or they're considered hired. And so this particular report is telling the story of the number of candidates that go through this journey. We also get the request frequently to do that in number of days. So that um, if we are going to post a job for a particular skill set, we know it averages 63 days from the time that the post goes up to the time the hiring cycle closes out. But for this one today, we're going to talk about just the, the volume or number of candidates that go through the process. And so for this story, um, looks like there were 25 applications received. The gold bar is the ones that were accepted or moved through the process. And the top um, bar, the dark green, has a number six. Those are the ones that were declined. So maybe they didn't meet the minimum requirements in the application process, or they didn't have the right type of visa or green card, et cetera, whatever is required for the particular job. You can um, mouse over this if you want to see what happened. In this case of the six, um, five were eliminated. That's the code that was put in. It wasn't more specific than that. And one was kept on file for maybe future opportunities. So maybe not the right skill set for this particular position, um, but a, a good candidate uh, maybe for a different role. And so the story that's told on this screen is it went from um, you know 19 acceptable candidates down to 16 that passed the screen, 13 made it to the first round interview, and all the way down to the end where you can see the numbers kind of decline, how many went through the process here. Additionally, on the screen, you can see it at the individual candidate level. So we can see um, how much time, uh, you know, Chris, uh, how many phases that Chris went through. It's color coded in the way that the KPIs are defined by the organization. Another thing to highlight on this is that you could have um, it sliced by a particular department or a particular type of role. So this uh, report is by the job post itself, and there's just a numeric code in here that's pretty generic, but that could be um, the actual job title um, but, or whatever coding system is meaningful to your organization. So if I click, uh, let's see what job post one did, the whole screen's gonna redraw and you can see that there were 25 applicants for that and not very many got um, past the interview stage. We can see that Ryan was hired for that particular job. And any, any of these job posts are going to give you um, different data sets depending on the role. This is just one way that you could use recruiting data um, to tell a particular story or to dig in to see what the process looks like. So I'm going to hand this back to Melinda. Hello. Thanks for, thank you very much. We're going to have a couple more people giving you a couple more demos like that in just a few minutes. But I wanted to take a minute and turn it over to our experts from the vineyard and get that part of the uh, evening started. Perfect. Thanks, Melinda. Um, so, again, I know Melinda touched on base about some of the guys not getting the packages, and I truly apologize for that. Unfortunately, uh, I don't know what happened. FedEx truck uh, broke down and it kind of messed up on the routine and backtracked it about two days. I know a lot of them I checked today for uh, tracking and that you we, you are getting the shipments today at some point. So while you're do doing this virtual, you might get a knock on the door that it's coming. But I know a lot of you did get it finally today, too. So uh, but bear with us and uh, eventually you will get your wines. And if you don't, something happens happens, please email me right away and we'll get you the packages no matter what. So, but uh, we will kick it off with the first wine um, and then Joanne and I will talk more about the, the winery and what we do here and, uh, and the whole history about us. So um, for you guys that have the Sauvignon Blanc, if you want to crack it open um, and we'll do a little cheers and then I'm going to have Joanna kind of talk a little bit more about the, the Sauvignon Blanc. So. Oh, so. This is our 2019 Kick Ranch Sauvignon Blanc coming from our vineyard in the Fountain Grove District, which we'll touch on a little bit later. 
2019 Sauvignon Blanc, 100% Sauvignon Blanc. And we're using two different clones to make this. Clones are basically the different types of root stock we're gonna use. So we have Mousquet, which is known for its heavy uh, and bright aromatics. And then we also have 317, which is all about structure. So once we picked this fruit, we brought it into the winery. We did a really long, about three weeks and very cold fermentation. Then we put it in about 25% neutral French oak barrels. The rest of the wines, so we had about 75% left. We put that into stainless steel tanks. We let that age about six months on the lees. Lees are just dead yeast cells that add more body and a little bit of a creamy texture to the palate. Then we bottled it and now it's ready to drink. Perfect. So cheers. So we're going to cheers to you guys. So I'm going to share with you guys a little slideshow that we do. Um, Oh, you're muted. Sorry, we can't hear you. We can hear you now. Yeah, it's funny because when I share, it will not let me talk to you guys while I'm sharing. Try it again. I'm going to try it one more time with you guys. Can you hear me now? Still? Yeah. Yeah? Can you guys see the, the screen too? No. <laughs> no. Okay. That's weird. There we go. How about now? We're good? Yes, we can see your screen and we can hear you. Say one more Perfect. time. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, we're going to start this over. So right there is our entrance to our vineyard. Uh, we are Brickler Vineyards, and uh, we are brand new. Uh, we just, our grand opening was May of last year, uh, right during COVID. And everybody always feels sorry for us because we, got to open up this amazing winery right in the heart of COVID. But to be honest, last year was a, a phenomenal year. Uh, and even this year was a, a pretty amazing too so far. So everything's worked out really, really well oh, for yeah. us. Uh, we are growing rapidly. And uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that we do here is very different compared to other wineries. We have a huge food program that we involve with all our wines here, which is uh, really phenomenal. So I'm gonna show you some more slides, we'll get through it. Uh, this is the front of our uh, tasting room. This is our big winery barn that we have here on site. And, uh, you know, our goal is to host a lot of events, uh, parties. Uh, we do our every day-to-day -day tastings right, right there, uh, which is amazing. Right there, you're seeing one of our dinners that we hosted a couple years back. Um, uh, we do a lot of vineyard dinners that way and always beautiful one long table, uh, amazing food presentation. So I'm gonna let Joanna talk about the actual definition of Bricolor Vineyards, which is actually really, really fun. So. Yeah, so Bricolor is not a word that you might hear often. It is a French word, and it means one who starts building something with no clear plan, adding bits here and there, cobbling together a whole while flying by the seat of their pants. And you'll see some photos in a little bit. We do have a second label called flying by the seat of their pants, which is basically what we do here. I mean, like Chris said, 
we opened in the middle of a pandemic and we didn't really have a super clear plan of what this was going to become. But due to the struggles that we endured when we opened and, you know, thereafter, we have created such a outstanding community within ourselves and really showing what Sonoma County is all about. It's pretty amazing. So right there, the picture is our outdoor pavilion that we have. Uh, it's another section of our winery where uh, we host a lot of yoga classes right there, tasting, smaller dinners. Uh, it's just a little bit, I would say, 50 yards away from our tasting room. But uh, that's the beauty when you come to the vineyard here, which a lot of you guys will have to come visit us at some point. Um, but there are so many different locations. love it. So. We are a family run vineyard, uh, you know, right there, the, as you see from, um, you have Mark Hansen, uh, Beth Hansen and Sarah Citron, uh, Mark and Beth are, um, you know, I would say Mark has started basically his career in the tech business and, uh, Beth started her and still is into commercial real estate. And then Sarah, uh, ventured out of the, uh, fashion world from New York and came to, uh, run the family vineyard all together. So uh, we are excited to have them as, uh, as the family owners. They're amazing. They're very well involved, which we all love here. Uh, they're pretty much here every day to day and that help us out and do everything. And we have a fantastic legacy here with Bricolaire. Beth's great grandfather was Pietro Colo Rossi, and he was the original enologist for Sonoma County's historic Italian Swiss colony. Now, this was the biggest winery in this region in the 1800s, and it really jumpstart what we know as California wine country to this day. He trained in Italy and from uh, the Piedmonte region as a enologist, came over here, and like I said, revolutionized wine country for us. So we're paying homage to him with what we do now, and he was famous for Zinfandel, and we're not tasting our Zinfandel today, but if you can get your hands on a bottle, I highly recommend it. It's one of my favorites. Mine too. <laughs> so Carrie Gott is our head winemaker. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys know the last name Gott. Uh, if you've ever heard of Joel Gott Wines and uh, Gott's Roadside, uh, all family uh, related. Uh, Joel is Carrie's son. Uh, which Carrie's been making wine for the last 52 years, which is pretty amazing. Uh, started out in the Amador County area of Sacramento region and then ventured out to Napa, which he was the head winemaker at Davis Vineyards for a long time and a few other places. So kind of officially retired from the big corporate kind of winemaking business and uh, met up with Mark and Beth and decided that uh, he wanted to become our winemaker for us and help smaller uh, family vineyards, which is amazing. So, you know, for us to be brand new and have uh, a really veteran winemaker like Carrie, it really, really helps, so, which is awesome. And then to the left right here, we have our assistant winemaker, Tom, which uh, helps out with Carrie a lot and does a lot of uh, tastings here on the weekends with us. He's kind of a utility person, helps out with everything we do. And then I'm on the right right here, which you guys already know me. Um, and then right there you see Carrie and Tom. Uh, right now we don't have a production facility on site. Uh, we are still building our property quite a bit. Um, I think if you came here, you'd see how beautiful it is, but we are not done by any means. Uh, obviously with the fires that happened here in 2019 in California, really bad. And then COVID last year, we really kind of held our construction for now. So we hope to uh, restart construction pretty soon within the next year, maybe year and a half, and then build our production facility on site too, which is amazing. So right there, Carrie and Tom are uh, trying some of the Pinot right there that they uh, barreled. And that's our, our uh, custom crush facility called uh, Punch Down Cellars, which is about 20 minutes south of where the winery is in Santa Rosa. So I'm going to end it right there. And I'll share more with you guys after, but I will let you guys take it away now. We are back. Um, thank we don't have those same wines here in the room, but we did make do with some wine in the room. So we are. I love it. <laughs> um, and we can't wait to see when our boxes show up. Probably about five minutes after the main door. Yep. <laughs> so, um, 
but it's all good. Um, so we're going to go now to Aaron Garner. Um, Aaron's going to just share a couple of other um, dashboards and some information. So Aaron, if you could test out if you're going to share screen and uh, be sure you can unmute. Thanks, Melinda. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, great. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. As Melinda said, my name is Aaron Garner. I'm a product owner uh, for one of our honeycomb teams. And we support uh, three clients um, currently at this time on my team. And I'm going to share the screen momentarily. But first, I wanted to just uh, jump into a little bit of background um, about one of the clients. We're going to look at some versions of their reports today. Of course, the, the data has been anonymized. And so you won't see any actual client data. But the, the look and the feel of the reports and the functionality is in line with what they are currently using today in their production environment. And while we are walking through that, I really wanna focus and highlight on a couple of the key aspects from what Adrian mentioned earlier, and those revolve around process improvement and obviously analytics. Um, it's, it's pretty much at the crux of, of what we do here at Honeycomb and working with our clients. So in working with this client who's in the healthcare industry, it became really apparent that they, they knew a little bit about their data. Um, anecdotally anyway, and uh, we were able to work with them early on and kind of turn that intuition into insight with some of the reports that I'll show you here momentarily. And it also became very clear to me that um, in working with them that there was a tremendous amount of opportunity around process improvement. So their, their world of analytics before was uh, running a manual report out of their HR system and disseminating it however often that they did. And I think as Adrian already mentioned earlier, you know, digging back through your email is really hard to discern any types of trends or really dig into the data when that's the, the world of, of reporting and data that you live in. So we have been able to ingest uh, data from their HR system, their EMR system and other external sources into, into their data warehouse here in Honeycomb. We've even been able to take some of their data and send it to external systems, which has assisted them with tracking COVID testing. And also they're rolling out a program soon for continuing ed and certification tracking of their staff. So um, that also ties into the, the HR arena as well. But now I will go ahead and share screen and walk you through a few of their reports. Um, kind of want to highlight a couple of things also around the analytics specifically that was touched on earlier by Adrian. Um, we like to tell stories with data and also obviously identifying trends within the data as I'd already briefly touched upon this particular client was not able to do so as easily as one might like. So um, what you're looking at here is once again, this is anonymized data. There's no such thing as white tree healthcare. So we just kind of made a fictitious company up to coincide um, with the presentation here. But this is, a, this is telling a story of not only are we integrating data from multiple uh, data systems that they have, um, but it's also a, a prepared story for their executive team. They specifically requested this report in this look and feel. So getting back to Another point Adrian made where we sit down with the end users and we really hear them out and we work alongside them and we, we try to put their vision onto Canvas for them. What you're looking at here is a representation of their census, which is the number of patients that they would have in house. Um, once again, phony data here, but tells the story nonetheless in line with what they see. So what they, what they expect and what they hope is that as their census grows, so should their HR headcount or their personnel headcount, right? So those two should be in lockstep with each other. And conversely, over here, we have this called agency hours. What that is, is, is contracted agency hours. So when their staff may be low, they have to reach out and contract folks in, bring them into their facilities. And so that presumably costs them a lot more money than just hiring full-time equivalents, right? So Exactly what we're seeing here is what they hope to see. And, and that story is told here on the screen as their census grows, once again, so should their active staff and conversely, their, uh, con their reliance upon contracted staff should be declining. But it is worth noting, maybe down here in this last 
last week or so, they've had a pretty decent uptick, about 10% on their contracted staff. So this would allow them to dig into that a little bit more where before they may not have known that for weeks or months on end until they actually paid those invoices or, or those contracted staff out. Now they're able to see that in near real time and they can dig into it and they can start to ask questions and figure that out before that number continues to grow and grow and grow and then you know really impact the bottom line, if you will. Um, moving right along, so I know we're, we're uh, trying to get back to the wine tasting here. So here's a couple of other reports that we built for them. This is a collection of staffing reports um, highlighting specifically the number of hires, the number of terminations, um, which would be equivalent to just discharges, not necessarily someone that got fired. Um, we also are able to look at the average length of service and also the average length of employment. And those two things are different from them, but we are pulling this data in. And once again, the focus here is on the analytical trends, allowing the end user to dig into the data where once before they may have been reliant upon uh, weekly or monthly reports that were you know, just man, uh, manually ran and exported and disseminate, disseminated out to staff. While I'm walking through this quickly, I do wanna showcase some of the functionality within within Power BI, which is which is our reporting our BI tool here. So as you can see across the bottom, we've got monthly numbers of hires and, and departures or terminations as it's called here. And then your line is the variance. Um, some of this data is, is pretty much in lockstep. Once again, it's anonymized, but this also shows the impact of COVID, right? So this dip here was right really at the, height of the pandemic kicking off. And it's a healthcare industry that we're the, the client that we're working with. So like within their data, they're starting to see um, the impacts of, of COVID. But out here a year or so later, we really start to see their industry trend back up. And they've made a very concerted effort to go on a campaign, a hiring campaign, and try to get those vacancies filled. Because once again, it's all about trying to draw back to a the, the impact on the bottom line, right? Where you may have either staff um, expending lots of time in overtime or those contracted staff that we talked about before, um, it's definitely better to bring full-time staff in and, and work with them as opposed to those other sources um, that was mentioned. But um, nonetheless, I wanted to, to show here, we're looking at a monthly trend of, of hires versus terminations. Power BI does allow us to uh, work in what's called a hierarchy. So we're able to quickly roll that up by year. And you can see once again, probably based on a COVID impact, right? Uh, 2020 was a down year as far as hires versus terminations, but trending on up here in 2021. And we're able to easily drill back into that monthly view there. I'm gonna click over here to another page where we've got a couple of different versions of the average length of service. And we're actually looking at active staff. So the use case that they were looking for here revolved around, they wanted to know which facilities had the longest tenured staff because they expected that they would find that the culture of those facilities was far superior than those maybe that, that did not have as high or yeah, they were below average, if you will, with regards to um, their average length of service of active staff. Those facilities are, are experiencing a high volume of turnover and, and their staff are just not as tenured. So they're hoping, they were hoping to identify those facilities so that they could learn lessons about how those facilities operated and take that knowledge and work to apply it to the facilities that were below average. So what we see here, just that quick glance, this White Tree Healthcare has over 3,200 staff across the board. They have an average length of service of 40 months, as you can see here. And this is ranked from high to low. So once again, fictitious um, facilities would be listed here or, or offices, if you will. Um, and, but you can easily see which facilities are, are kind of leading, leading the charge there with regards to average length of service. And as we scroll down, we see these ranked from high to low. You can see which facilities are dragging behind. Let's say you wanted to, to dig into that a little bit further and we'll pick on the St. Louis office here. You can very easily 
uh, just click on their bar, <clears throat> excuse me, and drill through. And now we start to see the underlying data that will allow staff or HR administrators to dig in even deeper into some of the data. And you'll, and you'll see you know, how long they've been there, who they are, what their job title is, what department they're in. And you can really start to peel the layers back of the data that's incorporated here. And then one final thing, I wanted to show another area that they were really focused in. I'm, I'm sure we're all anecdotally aware that the healthcare industry was not only impacted very hard by COVID, but just in general, it's kind of a revolving door type of industry. And once again, they anecdotally knew that, but now having the data at their fingertips has allowed them to drill into that information a little bit further and really start to look at voluntary terminations or departures. So those are the folks that are leaving and it's why are they leaving? Well, they, they actually have a, um, as you can see represented here in 2021, they've had a, um, they just decided not to come to work one day. Um, and so also a, a large proportion of no call, no shows. I mean, I think anecdotally a facility would know that, but seeing this data rolled up across the board for the entire for the entire organization has really been insightful for them. And once again, there is the drill through functionality um, built into these reports. If you right click and you're able to just drill into it, you can really start to once again, slice and dice the data. But I know I'm, I'm up on time, so I'll, uh, I'll take it short. And if, you know, if anybody has any questions, we could certainly take them now, or we could uh, fill those later on or, or get back to you later. But I, I want to be cognizant of everybody's time. And I know um, bottle number two of wine is certainly maybe more of interest than, uh, than the next step in, in my presentation here. So I appreciate your time and attention today. And without any uh, further ado, I'll kick it back over to Melinda. Thank you. Yes, and that's a good point. Uh, thanks, Erin. If anybody has any questions for our uh, tech specialist or for our wine specialist, either one, uh, you can type those into the chat or um, just let me know. And I can, um, if you wanted to talk about it, you can just type into the chat. I want to ask a question. I can do be allowed to talk at the end too, and we can just talk and have a question, uh, conversation about it. Um, so feel free to do that. If you have any questions about the data, if you want to see something again about this and how um, they can make the data work for you, uh, definitely let us know that. Uh, but for right now, I'm going to kick it back to our vineyards so uh, they can talk a little bit more about wine number two. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, so yes, on to bottle number two now. So um, you know. The second bottle is our all estate grown Pinot right here on the property. And uh, I'm going to go a little bit more to Pinot. Uh, I'll let Joanna talk about the details of how we make our Pinot. But, you know, when you guys think about the location we're at, so we're in Russian River Valley, uh, which is, you know, the uh, big part of Sonoma County. Uh, and obviously there's different appellations all over Sonoma County where you can grow wines. But um, one of the biggest things, uh, I would say biggest varietals that um, Russian River Valley does is Pinot Noir. And Pinot Noir is one of the most finicky temperamental fruits to grow. Uh, it really takes the right climate and the right soil to grow. If it doesn't have those, it will not grow. So where we're at, you can see 100 degree summer days here but then 50 degrees summer nights here. So it's quite a big climate change. I mean, almost 50 to 60 degrees some, some nights we see, uh, which Pinot and Chardonnay absolutely love that, which is really awesome. So, Joanna? Yeah. So this is our 2018 Estate Pinot Noir. Like Chris said, it does come from the property where we are sitting right now. We have about 20 acres planted to Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Now, I love our Pinot Noir because it has kind of everything you could ever want out of a Pinot. When we'll taste it, you guys are gonna get some nice cherry cola notes, some cranberry, a nice white pepper finish. And that comes from how we make it. So we have five different Dijon clones planted here. Like Chris said, it's a finicky varietal. A lot of winemakers call it the heartbreak grape because it does take a very special hand to make a beautiful wine with this. So we take it, we put it in the winery, we destem it, we ferment it, and then it goes into French oak barrels. 35% is 
is going to be brand new. The other portion of that is going to be neutral. And it sits there for 14 months. So it has a lot of time to integrate with those oak barrels and develop into the beautiful wine we have in front of us now. So Chris is going to tell you about some food pairings at the Pinot. Absolutely. You know, I, uh, my background, I was a chef for 15 years before I got in the wine industry. And uh, I would say my, uh, my favorite wine to pair with was always Pinot Noir. Uh, Pinot Noir is the most versatile red wine to pair with. So keep that in mind. I know a lot of people think, oh, well, I'm having seafood. I'm having chicken. I'm having some salads. Uh, but I like my red wines and it just doesn't go well with it. But it does. You know, Pinot. You can throw anything you want at Pinot. One of my favorite things to do is when I get home, of course, I'm going to pop a bottle of Pinot open, and it doesn't matter what I'm going to have with dinner. It's going to go with it, and I love that about a Pinot. But my favorite pairing of all time, and everybody makes fun of me at the winery just because it's what I always say, if you've never had grilled salmon, grilled salmon and Pinot Noir, you're talking about – two things that are meant to be together and it truly elevates the flavors of the food. Also the wines are just meant to be, some wines are not food related. You just can just drink it by itself and it will not change the flavor. Uh, and there's some wines that absolutely change the flavors once you pair with that perfect pairing and salmon is absolutely one of those. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy this one. I'm going to share a little bit more slides with you guys uh, before we go kick it off for the next pres uh, presenter. Uh, but I'm going to do it right now. Perfect. So we left off right here. So I want to show you um, our lineup of what we do. Obviously, you know, we have uh, two different vineyards, which I know Joanne is going to uh, touch base on our second vineyard called Kick Ranch and our state vineyard here. Uh, but, you know, we make a lot of different varieties. I mean, obviously, a big question is, you know, everybody asks, can you find this in a store somewhere? And the the answer is no. Uh, you know, we're very small production. We're family vineyard. Um, we like to keep our quantities very small, more exclusive and here on the property. And obviously our wine club, our wine club is a big, uh, big way how we function every year. And uh, we do some really easy wine club setups, which is really fun for everybody. So, uh, but as you can tell the lineup, we do a Sauvignon Blanc, which you had, we do a Viognier, we do a sparkling wine called that with the flying by seat of our pants label. Uh, we do two different rosés. We do a uh, rosé of Grenache, which is the flying by seat of our pants label and then a rosé of pinot uh which is the brickler label right there uh we do the pinot noir which you're having right now we do an un oak chardonnay which is the green uh label that you see right there the old vines in that we were talking about earlier and then our chardonnay uh what's not included in there too we do a beautiful cab which we are going to have in a little bit um and then we're also uh just bottled our petite syrah our syrah we have a red blend coming out so our reds are really kind of starting to come in more and more now, which is great because it just takes a long time to produce and make. Uh, but we're excited to have all those. So these are a bunch of our awards that we've gotten this past year, which is really amazing. Uh, the cab that we will try in a little bit uh, was a best of class and show at the San Francisco uh, Chronicle Wine Competition, which is one of the largest wine competitions in the U.S. Um, I'm going to go back to that. Sorry. Went too fast. Um, the next two right there is our reserve Pinot Noir special selection, uh, which is phenomenal. Uh, it was a double gold winner this year. Uh, really amazing. Uh, very small quantity, which we're sold out, unfortunately, now. Um, and then we have our Rosé of Grenache uh, that you see was also gold, our Rosé of Pinot gold, and our Sauv Blanc that you're having, which was a gold medal winner. So really excited this year. Like I said, we're new, but you know, the awards are starting to come in and uh, we thank Carrie Gott and Tommy Pearson are our system winemakers. So um, Joanna's going to talk about our different vineyards that we have right here um, and where all the fruit comes from. So, yeah. So we currently are producing wines from three different vineyards. Two of them are estate vineyards, meaning that we own them as a company. So we have the Bricolaire Vineyard in the Russian River Valley AVA. Like we've touched on, that is where we're sitting right now. We have just over 20 uh, acres planted to Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Russian River Valley is perfect for those Burgundian varietals. We have a climate very similar to Burgundy, France. So we produce outstanding fruit forward and juicy Pinot Noirs. I just took a sip of this Pinot and my mouth is just watering. It is so juicy and delicious. We have our Kick Ranch Vineyard, which is in 
in the Fountain Grove District, which is in Santa Rosa here in Sonoma County. Our vineyard is located on the western slope of Spring Mountain, which is one of the uh, most famous mountain regions within Napa Valley. So we're getting uh, just the side going into Sonoma from that vineyard. And a lot of very notable wineries on the Napa side actually do source fruits, fruit uh, from that vineyard from us. We plant Bordeaux and Rhone varietals. So we have the Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, Viognier, Mouvedre, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, some really fun varietals coming out from over there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And we do a lot of different stuff, which is nice. So all our, uh, you know, pretty much everything we do is a steak grown, like I said, like Jonah said, except for our Zinfandel. Zinfandel is uh, one of the only ones we source. Same with our bubbles, our sparkling wine that we make, but everything else is from our two properties that we have, which is uh, fun. Um, here's a great picture of one of our events that we do, our dinner events. Uh, this was our Founders Club dinner, which was our first wine club that we released for our vineyard. Uh, which you became a founding member and we were 135 people that night right there one long table outside which is really amazing obviously you could tell that was before covid uh which we're starting to get back more into that kind of uh, dinner situation now that people are comfortable being back together which is awesome um here's a few shots of our property uh Right there, you see our, uh, to the left, right there, the bigger picture, our outside, outside pavilion that you kind of saw before in one of our slides, uh, underneath our trellis right there, which everything is growing. This is a, a great area. We do a lot of picnics out there. Um, it's really, really fun. So uh, then we have our rose garden right there, our bocce ball courts to the to bottom right. Uh, so we have two bocce ball courts, but like I mentioned before, the property is amazing. There's a lot that we can uh, that you can go around and walk and see. Uh, just so much to do. So here's a big um, picture of the winery barn uh, with our pond right there, which we do a lot of our tastings outside on the trellis right there, and then our inside tastings in the barn. This is inside the barn. Um, which is our indoor tasting room. We have our full commercial kitchen in there too. Um, we do almost, I would say majority of our tastings now in the winter time inside. Uh, you know, obviously summertime is more outdoor tasting, but um, it, it's really a gorgeous facility. All the wood that you see in there is reclaimed wood from a barn in Wisconsin. Uh, and it's just, uh, the pictures don't even do its justice. It's just really, truly remarkable. Here's a great picture of our first wedding that we ever did, which is, this was actually done before the barn was completed. Uh, this was uh, Sarah's wedding, which was Mark's daughter. Uh, and uh, they had a, did a wedding for 250 people with a live band in there. Uh, really uh, beautiful to see. Unfortunately, we don't do weddings right now. Oh, obviously, we were able to do it because of a family wedding. Uh, but hopefully in the future, we will be able to do some weddings like this. Uh, we talked a lot about our culinary program, our food that we do. Uh, this is one of our chef, Evan Castro, right here, uh, which is the uh, pretty much leader in the kitchen uh, and provides all our dinner stuff, our everyday tastings. You know, our when you come see us on a property, you know, we offer one tasting only, and it's our rooted tasting, we call it. And rooted is a tasting that is six small bites paired with six of our wines, which is really gorgeous. And pretty much our host, our one of our tasting room hosts will come out, present the wines, our chefs come out there, present the food, tell you everything that goes with it. So it's really an awesome experience. Here's more of a team picture of all our culinary advisors and program right there. Uh, we had just partnered up with uh, Charlie Palmer and chef Nate Appleman, which was one of the top chef winners uh, from, I mean, chopped winners. Uh, and then you see uh, Charlie on the left right there. Uh, but we are excited to have them on board. We just started with them this year. Um, and they will be, you know, pretty much teaching and leading our culinary and our chefs uh, here on the property and uh, doing more great things to come. So here's a couple pictures of our everyday tasting that we do. This is a part of our rooted tasting that we call it. And um, like I said, we do two small bites every time coming out with two of our wines and we pair it. Uh, so it's really just a fun tasting because it really elevates and shows you what you can actually pair foods with, with the wines. Cause I think a lot of people don't understand truly what everything you can pair. <clears throat> and I'm going to stop it right there and we'll finish up the slide with the, 
the rest of our wines that we're uh, gonna have. Awesome. So we just have one more little break in. So Sarah, while Sarah's getting ready, uh, she's gonna talk to us a little bit more about some more things that Honeycomb can do and how it can help you uh, get control of your data. So Sarah, test out your audio there. Yeah. Hello, good evening. Um, yes, so I'm Sarah. I'm a data visualization engineer here. So I help to tell stories with data with a, a human-centered design focus. And I'm just going to share um, two demos with you. We're going to breeze through them. Uh, the first one is a uh, for a nonprofit. Um, and similar to Aaron, this is all, um, I'm not, sorry, just a second. Uh, this is all fake data. So uh, you'll, you might notice some things that look strange or not possible. Uh, and so this is just a landing page and I'm gonna give you a little bit of context into uh, what National NP was requesting. They wanted a dashboard to be able to help prepare reports to their board quarterly. Um, but at the same time, they wanna be able to provide their um, national and local level leadership um, reporting capabilities down to their level. Um, and I know that the struggle that they have that maybe you've experienced before is that each leader kind of looked at the data differently, um, doing different calculations, presenting it in a different way. And so we have helped them to provide a standardized and centralized reporting um, uh, capability. And then that way they know that everyone is looking at data following the same business rules um, and coming to um, insightful decision making. Um, and this is just a summary perspective, as you can see that what they're reporting on is their contributions and donation programs, as well as community, community engagement. Um, they, they wanted the ability to just copy this, download it into a PowerPoint, send it in an email. But as you've seen before, it's also interactive. And so I'm just going to click and go to the home screen. Um, this is a high level perspective of the whole company and an overview and to the other detailed reports that we're going to glance at in a second. Um, what I like about this is that obviously on a screen, you only have so much space. And so we have the ability to show a trend line, but if you hover it, you can see a little bit more detail as well as you've seen with Aaron, the capability to drill through. Um, so knowing that they might be preparing a report for the board, a uh, higher level, um, maybe they have questions they're anticipating and they want to know where the data is coming from or they want to do th their own kind of analysis. And so this is just a detailed page um, that allows them to filter through. Uh, we were looking at the appeal method internet and so it already filtered it for us down to that level. Um, you can export it into Excel if they wanted to do their own analysis or um, maybe this just would help them to formulate even more, more questions and go to the data source owner. Um, and this takes us right back to what we're looking at. I'm just gonna go ahead into campaigns and appeals. So right now we're looking at the overall company perspective for the telephone and mail appeal method. Um, I'm gonna drill back up real quick. Um, so this is a trend line for all the years, but again, we wanted to give the capability to local leaders to be able to filter down um, to the areas that they're responsible for. And the thing about this is that once you've applied all the filters, you can then export it uh, with the filter set. Um, you can copy paste directly from here, um, copy a, a, a visual right into PowerPoint, et cetera. Um, and again, this goes through the, the drill through that I just showed you. Um, so I'm just gonna keep on going. Fundraising. Again, you'll see that this is uh, still high level. Uh, we've got a picture, um, some text, is, you know, tell a story with data, but they also wanted to be able to capture um, human stories as well um, and be able to supplement metrics with um, the connection to change lives. And so you see a little bit of gibberish down here but what we're enabling them to do, um, text us as often as they want to update it. So this might be uh, a, a consumer story for them. It's gonna be um, communities they're engaging or maybe donors that um, they're interacting with um, so that you can see the lives changed and how 
these different metrics connect to that. I thought that was um, a really neat request. Um, and then again, just to show you the capability of copying this uh, visual, um, I could copy it right into an email if I wanted to send it to my leader and ask a question, et cetera. Um, and uh, lastly, the engagement dashboard. Um, we may have talked about our iterative approach when it comes to dashboarding um, uh, data visualization. And so we are not in the final stages yet with this report because we do not yet have the demographic data for every level of the organization. Um, but currently it provides an overview for the whole company, as well as being able to drill through the different um, states to see the communities that we've reached so far this year. Um, and I'm just gonna share one more uh, dashboard briefly with you. Uh, some of you may have seen this before if you were at the um, SHRM conference. Um, and so it's an HR summary dashboard. Uh, it's gonna show us uh, you know, a summary here of all the different um, aspects uh, that they wanted to be able to put together in one report. And what I mean by that, I'm just gonna click here on diversity um, and inclusion is that it tells a story when you are able to put comparative metrics together along with trend lines, um, and it inspires conversation and questions to be asked. And so that's what we wanted to capture here are just some key metrics, but the ability to um, understand and get a snapshot of the company um, when it comes to diversity inclusion as a whole. Uh, and finally, I'm just gonna show you one more, uh, termination and turnover. Um, you've seen the ability to click through and filter things, but um, every aspect of this dashboard is also interactive. So if you wanted to see, okay, for 30 to 44 year olds, um, what are the top five reasons they left specifically? And it goes ahead and it filters every part of this down for that. And you can unclick that. Maybe we wanna look at females. Um, and again, you can apply a filter to provide even more context and detail. Um, this was a really fun, fun one. I like the colors, but um, you know, something about Power BI is that we can customize different themes, um, different colors um, pretty easily. So that is all that I have uh, to share for you today. Again, like Aaron said, if you have any questions or if you wanted to see more of these dashboards that I didn't get to share, um, we would be happy to do so. Um, thank you, Sarah. Uh, and we're going to turn it back to our vineyards because I think we still have one bottle of wine to finish. <clears throat> that we do. <laughs> we, call, we call this one the big boy now. <laughs> so the next, uh, our third and final one, unfortunately, I wish I had more for you guys. Um, <laughs> we're going to do is our 2018 Kick Ranch Cabernet Sauvignon. So um, this is our first vintage of a cab. And we're really, really excited. Like you saw on our uh, other slideshow, we uh, this one took a best of class at a number of different uh, wine competitions this year. Uh, the Chronicle being one of the biggest, the American Fine Wine uh, Competition, which is huge too. And then our Finger Lakes competition. We entered this in the Finger Lakes up in Michigan area, and it did really, really well. People loved it. Uh, we beat up beat out a lot of the French Bordeaux out there and other ones. So we we're pretty happy with that. So I'm going to pour a little cab for both of us and then I'm going to let Joanna take it over. Yeah. So like Chris said, our 2018 Kick Ranch Cabernet Sauvignon. Now we harvest this fruit, bring it into the winery and we split this into 50% new French oak and 50% neutral French oak. We use a heavier dose of new French to soften these tannins. We also age it for a little bit longer. We age this for 24 months in those oak barrels. Again, just longer time to integrate um, those beautiful oaky characteristics into the wine, soften those tannins. Cabernet's big, it just needs a little bit more time. Once we bottle it, we age it for an additional six months in the bottle just to soften it, give it a little bit more time to come into its own, then it's ready to drink. And this one is beautiful. Lots of dark fruit flavors, plum, tobacco, some great savory spices as well. It's too long. You know, I'm a sales guy. I got to sell this stuff. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it needs it though. Yeah, I know. I get it. I get it. Yeah. I mean, um, I do want to touch up on something. I mean, I know you've heard Joanna say neutral oak on a lot of things. And I think one of the biggest 
biggest questions we get here on the property is when we say those terminology of new oak, neutral oak, people say, well, what does that mean? You know, obviously new, a new oak is a barrel that is brand new that we've just gotten in from France and they are gorgeous, beautiful, very expensive, um, but they're wonderful. Uh, and then neutral oak, same barrel, but it's a barrel that we purchased probably a year ago or two years ago. And it's already gone through fermentation once or twice. So once it's gone through that first fermentation in that oak barrel, it's a neutral oak. Um, and that's what it is. So a lot of people, I think, get confused with that when we say new oak, neutral oak. But keep in mind, you know, there's there's so many different variances of how to make wine. And that's the beauty of this wine business is that, you know, every winemaker is very different on how they want to do it. I mean, some people want to go 12 months in oak and 50 percent new oak, 50 percent neutral oak. Like, you know, we want We did 24 months on this. 50 percent new oak, 50 percent neutral oak. A lot of Napa Valley cabs go 100 percent new oak. And then you just got to age it for a lot longer than that. Um, obviously, the, the more neutral oak you use, the less time you need to put it down to be able to open it. Uh, it's just more ready to go, which is beautiful. Um, I feel like our cab right here, yes, it's an 18. It's young, but also, you know, it's got those chalky tannins you're looking up front. It's got the nice dark berries on the back end. But it's pretty soft. It's not over the top. And I think a lot of people are always scared with a young cab like this because they're afraid it's not going to taste good. But uh, to me, I love it. I think it tastes great the way it is, but also would I be happy to age another five, six years? Of course. Oh, yeah. uh, when we talk about food with a cab, obviously, you know, anything heavy meats, red meats, uh, anything with some fattiness to it, like ribeye steak, duck, lamb, you know, that's where you want to pair your cab with because those heavy tannins really cut down, they, it cuts down a lot of the fattiness of the meats uh, and it brings out a lot more different flavors. So it's really fun that way. Okay, so I'm going to finish. Uh, I have one more share I'm going to do with the, with the slideshow um, and then we'll wrap it up from there. So perfect. So um, we actually have 287 olive trees on the property here, which is really, really amazing. So as you see right there, we make our own olive oil, uh, you know, which is uh, amazing. Uh, to me, I've never worked to olive harvest and I've always complained about the price points of olive oil until I worked my first harvest. And now I truly appreciate why people buy uh, you know, buy these $50 olive oils and why it's so unique. And after working at Harvest, oh my God, I would charge $100 now because it is time consuming labor, but also absolutely gorgeous. So we have uh, an incredible array of veggie gardens on the back side of our vineyard, uh, a lot of raised beds on our front side where the ponds are and where the um, rose garden is. So, you know, we really pride ourselves for our, our more plant to plate kind of a style. Uh, so a lot of our, you know, pairings that you're going to do, dinners that we host, pizza nights, there's some kind of ingredient from the property that's included and made with your food that you're going to have. So we really love that. We also have our chickens right here, our girls, you know, so we have properties to stay on the, uh, uh, right here on, on the vineyard that uh, you could rent out as club members. And you want to walk down to the chicken coop, get some eggs in the morning, make your own eggs, have at it. It's amazing. We also have honeybees, which I stay far from, uh, <laughs> but the honey is actually incredible. We do a lot of picnics. Uh, so when you're coming here in the summer, spring, uh, towards end of spring, summertime and early fall, we offer a lot of picnics here, which you can book online. And we have a pre-made picnic for you guys with two glasses of wine included. Really, really fun. It's, we, we host it in our uh, big pavilion up, up top, which you saw the pictures earlier. Um, there's our rose garden that you see right there. So we have 86 roses planted on the property right here, right next to our bocce ball courts. Um, you know, the best part about it, when people come to a tasting here, they do their tasting, their food wine pairing, they buy a bottle of wine and they just go walk the property and just enjoy. So one of Mark, which is not here with his favorite location to sit at is in the pavilion on the outer part right there, overlooking the vineyards with his Pinot bottle right there, or maybe that's mine. <laughs> 
and you can always enjoy some beautiful sunsets coming down or you know waking up early in the morning like this and uh, there's not a bad place to be right here so and that is it for you guys that is our property and everything that we do um i'm gonna end it right there and kick it back to melinda but if you guys have any questions about the wines or anything like that please uh chat in let me know uh we're here and uh we hope you guys enjoyed it thank you so much i learned so much uh, i cannot wait to taste these wines and i hope hopefully to come out i hope so today. Thank you. Appreciate that. If anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. But that's all of our, our things for today. Or if you raise your hand in the little um, the webinar thing, I can unmute you if you just want to talk to one of our experts or one of the vineyard experts. Uh, feel free to raise that hand and I'll, I'll unlock you on there. Um, or yeah, again, type it in there. But for everybody else, thank you so much for coming. And uh, we did record this. so. Um, if you signed up for this through the chat box, I will, um, uh, there's Matt. If you look at Matt, he's <laughs> at the, um, the cold uh, tailgate. Oh, that's, brought, that's nice. Now we have to drive there and get food. Yeah. Um, but anyway, if anybody does want to stay in chat, but other than that, thank you so much for coming. We will send out the recording of this so you can uh, look again at the different notes about the different wines. I want to thank our wonderful experts from the vineyard for um, being here with us, for shipping everybody the wine, and for being wonderful experts for us. And I want to thank all of our data and analytics experts for coming in and breaking through our wine tasting and helping you understand a little bit about what Honeycomb can do for you. So just let us know. Otherwise, we'll see you all later, and thank you very much. <laughs>